I want to welcome everybody to the City Chat. We didn't have any last year, so we are in need of starting again, and there's lots of information going on around town, lots going on. So um, this is Rob Getz from Parks, Dan Drescher, our City Attorney, Steve Wilkie, our City Manager, Diane, from our, who's our City Council President, and then Dwayne, and you represent public works, so you've got lots of good people to ask questions from. Yes, we anticipated a broad range of questions um, based on all the activities that we've been involved in. So we, I think we covered them all. We got parks, we got the legal, we got the public works. Dwayne's our in-house um, in engineer, and uh, then me and Diane. Um, so um, we've been, this early part of the year, we've been working on uh, goals and all the possible things that we could start to become involved in. And there are some four pretty major ones, which are Sandy Beach, uh, the Mill Pond, the composting site, and uh, the multi-use center, um, which we've been working on pretty heavily. Um, I also was involved in the community health forum. Uh, we've been working with um, Jefferson County Economic Development Consortium to form the Glacial Heritage Development Partnership, which is now doing business as Thrive. Got all that? I can do it in letters, too, if you want me to. Please don't. <laughs> so uh, we've been <clears throat> trying to finalize our current industrial park. Uh, we've been looking at housing issues and have... Um, three potential proposals out um, that will be presented to the council on their June 30th meeting. Um, the council has already looked at and authorized us to start negotiating um, development procedures similar to what the village of Howard in up near Green Bay has done, uh, which is actually to coordinate with uh, local developers to start helping them make lots available. Uh, we're also planning ahead for uh, additional commercial and um, industrial development and so there are several proposals out there. We're actually working with the county on several major proposals that would uh, start to drive economic development, industrial economic development in this community. Um, and most of the time we just spend our time trying to keep what we have running. So you'll notice that the elevator in the library is being redone. We did some work on the front step. We've relayed out the parking lot in the back um, and that, to deal with some handicapped issues, some parking issues, and some access issues. Uh, we're going to be redoing South Main Street next year, so I'm sure there will be well, yeah, that's right, this year. <coughs> so now I can say next year we're going to be doing Mulberry Street. Um, and then it'll continue from there. It'll go like Lake Street and then Fremont. And Woodland Beach Drive might be in there in some form or fashion. And uh, we're not quite sure how we're going to do that yet. Um, generally, when we do those types of projects, uh, the planning process that we go through is pretty in-depth. So you'll be in a meeting <coughs> for, a, for a street project, and we'll have Rob there because he handles the trees, and we'll have um, Paul and Dwayne there for water, sewer, electric, and stormwater and streets. And then Dan will be there for any legal issues, and I'm there, and Betsy's there, because she's the one that's got to figure out how to get all the money into the right places at the right times. And so we go through a pretty in-depth process. We also have generally Dustin there, who's the city planner, and uh, Brandon there, who's the um, consulting engineer. And so, like, where you're looking at doing American Way from Industrial Drive to Brickstone this summer, too. That will be a TID number two project. And 
And uh, does anybody here know where that is? You know where Wallace Park is? It's the street that would run along the south edge of Wallace Park. Uh, the developer has agreed in concept to donate the land on the south side of the street to the city. And then we would consider the developing that as uh, some sort of soccer sports complex. Um, on the north side is already pretty much baseball. Um, one of the proposals that we're dealing with is the high school would like to move their baseball diamond out there. Um, they need to relay out the campus street football field because as it's currently laid out, it's a safety hazard. And because the community has said that they want to keep the football field there, they have to kind of reshift it because that location where the, the uh, wall is is considered a, an extreme hazard. And, and so WIA is pushing them to modify that. So if they relocated the baseball field out to Wallace, um, they'd need to have lights. So then we're trying to figure out how to put lights on there. And then you get a pretty much dedicated diamond to um, older boys baseball, which right now they're kind of, campus has been generally that concentration. <coughs> so then we'd have to add, we'd probably add another diamond out there on the north east side. And then you already have the, the uh, little league complex in the middle. We've added a new concession stand out there. And we're hoping it's going to be ready this spring. <laughs> there, there are volunteer groups that are helping finalize the, the work. So some of the electric and some of the wiring is being done by, by uh, volunteers. So it's a little bit slower than maybe what we're used to. <coughs> um, but those, you know, those are the things that we're working on over there. Dwayne has about... <coughs> Dwayne runs our street maintenance program, which is eight, which this year will be eight hundred thousand um, dollars. And when I say maintenance, that's not like a rebuild. So South Main Street is a full rebuild. Um, his projects would be more like oil and chip, sidewalk repair, curb repair, storm uh, stormwater inlet repair, uh, mill and overlays. Uh, those types of projects. So uh, we tried to make sure that we didn't have every street in the city blocked off at the same time this year. Correct, yeah, so we tried. Um, so like let's take South Main Street. <coughs> South Main Street for us is we had to pay about $275,000 for the engineering to the state, which I think is a percentage somewhere around 50% of the project cost for engineering. Uh, we then had to pay our engineers to do the water and the sewer. The last estimate I had was 1.7 million for the sewer and 1.9 million for the water. Uh, I think we put in somewhere around $850,000 into electric. Um, and then we have to pay for the additional, we have to pay for the parking lane. So that cost us about another $500,000. Um, and we are putting in decorative street lights. Uh, so that cost us another $600,000. Um, we are also paying f for two programs. One is, is if you want a big tree in your front yard, the city will place it. And Rob handles that program. Um, in along South Main Street. So if you lost a big tree in front of your house and you want a new one that could grow into, let's say, an oak or a maple or an elm, Rob would help with those types of locations because the city is going to do a uh, special kind of concept down South Main Street. We're going to go with all flowering trees on that, small flowering trees, so that in the spring it kind of has a cherry blossom effect. <coughs> Um, and, and similar, we put trees about every 40 feet on every street. Um, so right now we're a little bit behind. So he still has Brewster Street to do, which was the one of the was the main project for us this year. And then he has East Lake Park Place to do yet. So he's got a lot of 
tree planting on his schedule. Yeah, plus he's removing all the ash trees, so you'll see a lot of trees coming out. He, <coughs> he also removes a lot of other types of trees besides ash. He, he goes through and evaluates them all. So there's a lot of, you'll probably see a lot of trees coming down. Um, and <coughs> we've removed about 50 trees on South Main Street already. Um, there's about another 50 that DOT will remove, probably starting in early May. Um, and then there are some private trees that may come down. We, we weren't involved in that, so that's not, not something that we, we were involved with. But um, uh, So we'll have a lot of trees to have to replant. Um, but everything on South Main Street is now off of power poles, so there, um, the street lighting will be a type of decorative street light. There will be no power poles unless, did we, everybody agreed to go underground to the house, right? There are a few, but some of those are because they're, they're coming from the backyard. Okay. That are still overhead, but the majority of the residents <coughs> are getting an underground service. Okay. Whenever you go underground, everybody else has to go underground. And not all property owners are prepared or willing to do that. So there are some issues that we have to resolve to work through to make sure that that uh, we can that all the power poles will be off the the street. Um, when we do mulberry, <coughs> we are not taking all the power poles off the street. We're only taking them off in the historic district, and that's to save as many trees as possible. <coughs> um, Anything else on that? Anything else you want to talk about? We've had a, a pretty eventful week. We did a lot of conversation Tuesday night on the mill pond and the potential dredging and other potential uses in the mill pond. Uh, and then we talked about the redevelopment of the Sandy Beach site. <coughs> the city owns from Rotary Park all the way down to Sandy Beach. Uh, and we own the trailer park that's in between them, and we own the restaurant. And uh, we've historically leased out the restaurant to um, restaurateurs, uh, and we lease out the trailer park. Um, as noted in the study, and uh, it's online if you want to read it, for the Sandy Beach redevelopment, um, the initial driving force was um, the water and sewer in the trailer park. The trailer park was developed in the early 60s hasn't been touched much, so you got a lot of old one-inch plastic lines and two-inch water lines, and they're all falling apart. And so it becomes a public health hazard because you have water leaking all over the place and sanitary sewer running all over the place, and you need to get that fixed. And so if we go in and redo it, we need to redo it to the standards that are set by the state now. So we have to go in and, and have certain lot sizes, certain street widths, certain water quality, sewer quality standards. And <clears throat> from a maintenance standpoint, we also have certain things that we try and look at and say, okay, we're willing to pay more money up front to have in place so that every year we're not spending as much on maintenance because um, Rob has to go in and, and uh, make sure that every home is winterized or every, every site is winterized, so he has to go through and make sure that the water and the sewer are shut off and that they're blown out. And so for a hundred and some trailers, that gets to be, that gets to be quite an activity, especially when <laughs> they're, not, not, they're not all constructed to a standard. Um, <coughs> the streets in there are ver getting very bad. Um, there are so many pine trees in the north side, and they tend to like to shoot off fireworks and other types of activities in there. So those pine trees are becoming a fire hazard, and with one access, that becomes an extremely dangerous site. That many trailers packed into a site that becomes very flammable is another issue that we know about. We also know that the, there's no weather uh, shelter there, so the new site has a weather shelter put into it. As we were working through this process, we had inspections on all the buildings and all the facilities that are associated with it. Uh, came to our attention that the restaurant building is on a short, on a very short life. In fact, 
I think the year we did the inspection, the fireplace that was in there started separating from the wall, and we come to find out that the floor is sagging so much that the fireplace was tipping in. So we had to remove the fireplace. We did a little, and we did about twenty twenty-five thousand dollars worth of work to get it in place. But we know that that restaurant needs to be replaced in relatively a short period of time. They gave us five to ten years. We're about when it three four years into it. Um, and so we're trying to look at getting that taken care of relatively quickly. Um, as we did that, there were a number of items that we said, okay, let's look and see if we want to continue to move further. Because Rob would like to have the boat launch out of the center of the beach and have one big wide open beach, get the boats off to one side, and make it easier for the recreational uses separate from the boat uses. Um, and then there were, we looked at several other di ideas for revenue uh, raising because <clears throat> the way it's set up now, and I don't know what the anticipation was in 1978 or whenever we bought that, that uh, site, but they just dumped all the money that they got from the trailers and every other type of use that they had down there into the general fund. Um, and the general fund is a very regulated type of activity by the state. At least it is now. It probably wasn't then, but it is now. So when we do our financing, the levy is capped at zero. And the levy is the amount of money that we get from property taxes every year. So if we make two and a half million dollars, doesn't matter how much the assessed value of your house goes up, how much new property is brought into the house, it stays at two and a half million dollars. The, they do have some exceptions. So you get like 60% of the net new construction, which is a very created type of concept by the state to try and give you a little bit of inflationary increase, but not much. Um, and so that's what we, and over 50% of all our revenues off that property tax. So the, all the activities down at Sandy Beach generally bring in close to $400,000. And that goes into our general fund, and we use that pretty much to fund all of Rob's activities. His, his department spends about seven, dollars $800,000 a year. So if we remove that $400,000, so we rebuild the restaurant, we rebuild the beach, we rebuild the trailer park in one year, we lose $400,000 with absolutely no way to recover that in any form or fashion. So we virtually have to shut down the Parks and Recreation Department for a year while we do this. Um, that's not generally a good concept. They, they handle a lot of things that people want in other areas. They're in the cemetery. They're in you know, all the other parks. They set all our piers. They you know, handle all the, uh, what do we call them, the lake ends, pier ends. And um, they set up for all the baseball diamonds and handle all the work at Rotary Park. So they, they're pretty active in a lot of other areas than just Sandy Beach. Um, they pick up all the garbage in the downtown. Um, <clears throat> so it, we have to try and figure out how to create a revenue stream, not only to pay for the, the improvements in the park, but to carry us from that point where we shut down until we're again generating revenue in that area. So that's kind of a very complex set of issues that we kind of have to try and work through. Um, it's not, let's just go out and do it. Um, so, the mill pond is, is um, you know, I, <clears throat> I look at the old pictures and I, I have a lot of, I know the history about when we tore out the old boathouses on the mill pond. Um, does anybody here remember the old boathouses on the mill pond? Yeah, the, uh, Judge Kiesling and his family lived on the mill pond. Their kids used to water ski in the area that's now just cattails and marsh. Um, so it, the, the whole concept of the mill pond has changed. And, and when we looked at 
redoing the dam, there was a lot of debate about just letting it go native and not having a dam. Um, which I know that Rob and I thought was a great idea. Uh, of course, we don't own a house on the lake whose property value would drop pretty substantially by not having a, a recreational lake. Uh, because the overall water level would drop pretty substantially in the lake uh, at times. So the state really regulates us pretty narrowly on what the levels of the lake are. So we drop the lake down pretty much to natural levels in the wintertime. That helps with um, ice erosion um, and with spawning and cer certain types of other habitat that needs to be in the lake during the winter to help maintain the, the lake's uh, overall health. In the summertime, we jack it up to make sure that people's boats can come out of their boathouses and into the lake and that you can pull up to the piers and get in. It used to be that when it was held lower, you'd have, most people, if you remember, talk about how rocky the shore of the lake was and you could walk all the way around the lake on the sh rocky shore. Uh, now that, that doesn't happen because we pull the water level up to make sure that it comes pretty close to the, to the houses. So those are issues that we deal with. So we became a recreational lake. The housing values are built on that. And so that kind of drove the idea that we were going back to having a dam. Well, once we went back to having a dam, then we have to deal with the sedimentation of the mill pond and how the mill pond is going to be handled. And so we, we, con we con at least from a conceptual nature, need to have some type of management plan for how we're going to handle that. If we're going to dredge it, if we're going to let it fill in, uh, we still have to dredge some level because we have to get the water overflow out to the dam and to keep the dam functional. And so those are, you know, certain types of activities that we have to be involved in. There's a lot of, you know, work that has to be done on the channel and that type of stuff and on the shores along veterans. Um, the banks there along Veterans Drive just north of the fire department. So we have to, we have to figure out how to deal with those in, under any situation. One of the sedimentation issues we have to deal with is the stormwater that's coming into the mill pond from the roadways. So we, there's a proposal in there for how to put in sedimentation removal devices, um, which I think the council is looking at putting in for a grant almost immediately. That was one of the items they thought needed to be done right away. Uh, the, um, then we looked at it not just from a long-term maintenance standpoint, but from an economic standpoint. Said, okay, if we made a couple of changes, could we get boats into the mill pond? Who then could have access to the downtown? Get a lot of requests, both from <coughs> business owners downtown, mainly restaurants and breweries and distilleries. Um, and then people that live on the lake and people that do have access to it, well, we'd like to be able to get into the mill pond, um, dock, go downtown, eat, and then go back out and enjoy the lake for the rest of the night. So we looked at those types of concepts and what it would take to be able to do that. So that's been incorporated into there um, from that standpoint. So the council gets to weigh those types of options. So those are things we've looked at in that standpoint. Composting. The city currently has a yard waste site, which is not a compost site. Uh, you haul it there, we haul it to another site and bury it. The advantage that we have right now and why this works for us is because the site that we bury it at is about a half a mile away. And it doesn't cost us anything to haul there. Once that site fills up, then we have to find another site which we will have to pay for. So not only are we going to be hauling a substantial distance, probably 8, 10 miles at least, and then we have to pay to be able to dump there. And then you have to think about, you know, we have to have a piece of equipment to load it and the trucks that have to haul it and the number of men that have to do it and the cycles that we have to go through and how much time we put into it. So it becomes, it goes from an operation that would, probably cost us somewhere around $100,000 a year to several hundred thousand dollars a year if we go that site. So if we're investing that type of money into it, we wanted to look at something that had more benefit and, and, and required less hauling. 
So a composting site would take us to that level. Now we tie in, um, we do leaf pickup and we do brush pickups. And so we haul to the site and then, you know, the yard waste that's brought in. Um, so we, we have a pretty large amount of material that could be composted enough that it would take a pretty significant size site. So some of the debate is where are we going to do this at, what's it going to smell like, um, and those types of questions. And, and what else can you add to it? Because yard waste creates a compost that isn't the highest quality for um, most of the types of compost you'd be looking for. Um, so there are a couple options. Um, you can take food from restaurants in the garbage, so you could have people s separating out their food, and that adds to it, changes the value of the compost, makes it much more valuable. Has a, you could probably have a better sale, so if we baked it and sold it, it would be more valuable. Uh, but it smells more. Um, we could also add sludge from the wastewater treatment plant. That would do about the same thing that food does. Um, but it's, well, we could add sludge. Generally, when sludge hits a certain point at a wastewater treatment plant, the smell is pretty much gone. Um, it's that first several months of curing that gives you that great smell. Um, but if you did it that way, most, <clears throat> most people have a little bit of trouble adding fertilizer that has human waste to it. Uh, you, you also have to make sure you have to put more detail into it because when you put human waste into it, there are certain types of um, diseases and bacteria that can get incorporated into that. Um, so you have to make sure that the temperature of the compost pile hits a certain temperature to kill all of those. So it, it becomes a more complicated process. Uh, anyway, so we're, we're working through those. The council will get that at their February 20th meeting. Uh, then the next one is going to be the multi-use facility study. Um, and that was a... We kept having someone tell us there was a need to have a senior center. I won't say who it was. And uh, it kind of pressed the council in that direction, and the council decided to look at it. And they decided to open it up to a broader spectrum of opportunities, youth, community health, and senior opportunities. So we kind of, we didn't name it the community center because we already have a community center. But we named it a multi-use facility, and we looked at the broader spectrum of uses that could be used for. So the... When the report comes out, it'll kind of detail for you a lot of the uses that the community sees as not being met that could be met under in this type of design. Um, one of them is a better setup for senior activities. Um, a lot more opportunity for health and wellness opportunities to be better laid out, um, actually be in a facility that can be heated um, and then um, what brings him? Oh, the elevator. I thought he was going to talk about the multi-use center. <laughs> <laughs> That's the architect that went through and did the study for us. Um, so we were looking at all these activities and there were other ones. There was like um, a lot of youth related activities. So Head Start, 4K, some other types of activities that the school could use in that facility to make. And, and kind of the goal was to have a facility that had all age groups in the facility because um, it said that the interaction of all the age groups provided a more vibrant community activity and provided um, good opportunities. The Elderly uh, enjoyed being with the youth, and the youth got a lot of benefit from being around el elderly people, and you had all the other people in that spectrum in between. It gave them a much much more diverse and, and well-rounded opportunity to be 
involved in the community. And so that's what we were trying to look at taking care of. There were, there were also a lot more sports-related activities. That's a part of the report. It hasn't been pushed as hard. That would probably be related more towards the, the redevelopment at Wall or the new development at Wallace Park. Uh, some additional structures that will be constructed out there. But those, those are the types of proposals that are coming out in that. We have looked at um, doing a lot of other activities. We're looking at, we're getting to the point where we're getting ready to close out TID number two, um, the, the, old, the industrial park um, over by CP Avenue is um, getting pr pretty close to the end of its life. So it's time to start planning for a new one. So that's an activity that we've been spending a lot of time on and looking at um, where it could be, what the requirements need to be, what businesses are looking for, um, and those types of things. So we're, we're working pretty hard on that. Um, obviously, uh, one of the big drives with this Thrive and this is um, trying to figure out what the problems are with for businesses in Wisconsin and how we can help them meet those needs. And in our area, it's large lot industrial land. Um, so most of Jefferson County does not have 60 to 120 acre sites available. The other one is workforce. And workforce in Jefferson County is a huge issue. Uh, so we're currently doing a survey to find out what it would take to keep the people who leave Jefferson County every day to stay in Jefferson County and then to draw people into Jefferson County. Um, Wisconsin as a whole has a pretty substantial workforce. Um, and that workforce, about almost 70% of them are employed actively, which is one of the highest participation rates in the nation. Um, so it's where does this workforce come from? And every day there are more people retiring than are coming into the workforce. And so it's getting worse, it's not getting better. And so it's how do you make up this difference? And there are a lot of policies in place that I won't talk about, that I don't think are helping. Um, but as you look to who's going to be working and where, uh, Wisconsin um, needs to figure out how to make people happy with cold weather. <laughs> and I think that that's probably one of the, the biggest issues that we have. We lose a lot to Colorado which is, tends to be colder, or as cold, but has a lot more different types of activities than we have, you know, skiing and views and the vistas. Um, and then down south, um, Georgia, Texas, California, well, those places are doing pretty well. As far as the workforce, we're one of the highest educated manufacturing workforces in the nation. Um, and we're either number one or two in manufacturing jobs in the nation. Every, any given day we can change with Indiana. Uh, so from that standpoint, if you're looking at Wisconsin and you want a job, you should be, and you want to stay in Wisconsin, you should really be thinking about a manufacturing job, at least weighing it. Because if you're thinking about it, you might want to look at a technical education and generally you might want to look at an apprenticeship with the business who will then pay for your education and then you don't end up with a, a bunch of college debt and then move into one of these jobs. Uh, so at, as you come out of school, you should be thinking about those types of things. Um, we are looking at spending a lot more time trying to figure out how to get students to weigh those items before they decide to go to college, accumulating a lot of college debt that then either have to move out of the state or uh, take one of these jobs that, that doesn't pay the kind of money that it would take to, to uh, cover that debt. You're generally looking at somewhere, at a starting wage, somewhere around $50,000 a year, and you can, most of these jobs are hitting into the, the $100,000 
to $110,000, which isn't bad in Wisconsin. I think the average wage in Wisconsin now is like $51,000. So if you're looking at that and you're trying to make a living in Wisconsin, most people can make a pretty decent living at $100,000. And a lot of these uh, engineering jobs in the city, they get pretty close. So if you're looking at Astolin Engineering or Chapter 2 or um, uh, DeVore Tool and Die, um, there are several of them in the city that, that are involved in that. Uh, you, can, you should be able to do pretty well. Um, other than that, are there any questions? Uh, Sandy Beach Restaurant, what, what's kind of like on your list of options that you're, the city's considering? As far as, you know, we've, we've heard, we're newly moved here. We've heard rumors that they're, they're thinking of tearing it down and opening it up as a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a larger location where you could do weddings and things of that nature. I'm just wondering what's, what's on the docket for options. If it's in, within the next year or two, it has to be uh, tore down in one, some capacity or another. Anything uh, out there, like any any developers uh, coming your way and talking about options or anything of that nature? Well, I just want to look. Yeah. I just, well, first of all, we're not looking at it for the next year or two. The current building <clears throat> was just repaired. And we're good to go for the time being. But it is not a long term, and the building itself is not of the uh, quality that uh, would warrant, you know, sticking a lot of money into it. And that's where you're hearing people about tearing it down. Eventually, we are going to have to tear it down. It just is not a good building. Okay, it would be like putting a lot of work into a house where the foundation is poor. That kind of analogy. So, so nothing that fast. I just wanted to comment on that. Then I'll turn it over to you. Um, we did all our analysis kind of on the process that we use now. Um, we did <clears throat> weigh and balance some other ones, and they will have those options to discuss those. Uh, we're not going to sell the real estate. Um, would we look at a 99-year lease and let someone else build the building? Yes. Uh, but um, the long term is, is that's going to be our real estate. Um, and this goes back to when the site was bought, why we run a trailer park. <laughs> um, the, the idea was is that the city wanted to control all the real estate uh, related to that site because they bought it. They want to be able to have the long-term access to the recreational uses and they don't want to have the battles that you would have to have with someone else owning the real estate in there. So it's like when we looked at the trailer park um, and did the financial analysis. I, I know everybody wants me to build condos out there. We make we're proposing to make about four to five, four thousand dollars per trailer. So we have about, we'll have about ninety trailers in there. <clears throat> that's just on the rents. That's not including all the other items that are in there. If you take a two hundred thousand dollar condo, you know how much the city would make on that? About eleven hundred bucks. So you're either going to have to have really, really expensive condos, which are harder and harder to sell, I mean, so, or you're going to have to have a lot of condos. So you're, you're probably looking at 300 condos in that site to generate the same amount of money that those trailers generate. And I, I, when you think about this and you think, okay, my $200,000 house, I'm paying $3,500 worth of taxes on. Only about 1,100 of that goes to the city. Then you have the school and the county and 
MATC and all those other ones. So you, when you're evaluating this out, you have to think about that. So in order to generate the amount of tax revenue off of a condo, you'd have to have probably about 300 of them. To get 300 condos in there, you probably have to have four or five story buildings. Yeah, Mark? When you're doing this condo cost comparison and not considering the amount of money that you get when you sell the condo, and that could be, let's say, if you invested that, you get interest, that would also be a yearly income. When you look at that, Mark, and you're saying, okay, you're building the condos and you're selling them? Well, if you don't sell them, you get more than $1,100 a year. But you're building them, so you're putting in an investment. So you have to go through and put in all the water, all the sewer, all the buildings, and then you sell them. So from a standpoint, all you're getting is the investment off the land. So it's not that substantial in, a, in an investment potential, especially when the city has already expressed significantly that they want to own the land. So, so if you're looking at that investment, it's not as significant. Uh, so when you're doing a straight comparison and you're looking at, especially nowadays, where interest, you know, 20 years ago where interest was pretty good and you could have invested that money and hung on to it and generated it. It's kind of like the doing the analysis at the cemetery and the endowment fund that, you know, you, every lot you sell goes into an, into an interest-bearing account and then that interest is supposed to maintain that. Well, 20 years ago, the financial analysis on that was a lot different than it is nowadays. And, you know, we're not allowed to invest in, in uh, mutuals and, and uh, those types of funds. We have a very limited amount of investments that we can make, state statutorily controlled. So we, d we don't get to run out and invest in any type of high-risk options. <clears throat> so when you're looking at our overall benefit, it's pretty narrow. So if you're looking at $1,000 to $3,500 and then having long-term control over that, so let's say at some point in time the city decides that they want to expand that into a full park all the way, we still have that control and that option under a trailer park, uh, and we still have all the facilities in there to be able to do that, whereas we don't with condos. That's, that's gone then. That's a decision that we've made then to give up all that real estate. Uh, and that's that's one of the driving reasons behind that. Um, I'm John Luke to the area, so uh, if I can get some backstory here. Um, in California, there was a lot of mobile home trailer type parks where the properties were kind of at the end of their lifespan. Some of them were built in the 60s and 70s and had asbestos. Um, are the homes that you're talking about, um, are they okay like that or is there going to be a lot of maintenance involved in bringing them and keeping them up to code? Uh, these are trailer parks that were, and a lot of those trailers are 60s and 70s. Some of them are older than that. Um, uh, well, let me put it this way. I think that we believe that probably 70% of them will not be allowed to be moved back into the trailer park. In fact, I would probably bet that 50% of them will not survive the move out of the trailer park. Um, I, I think some of our analysis was is that the framing underneath is so rusted out that walking across, someone like me walking across the floor is a risk. Um, they've, you know, no axles, no tongues, no, they've disposed of those years and years ago. Um, this trailer park has become, has been in the form and fashion and has been <clears throat> not run like a normal trailer park, so people have put in investments into it that make it, where it's not really a trailer park, it's kind of like a <clears throat> commune. Um, so um, maybe some of the features associated with the mobile home are more valuable than the actual mobile home. Right. So as you have to clean all that out to bring this site up to standard. Plus we're changing the format of the trailer port. The, it is going to be set up like it is now. It's going to be made so fire trucks can get in and it's going to be more aesthetically pleasing. Uh, we will not have coniferous trees, we will have hardwood trees uh, that will take some time to grow, but that's how life is. 
um, and so forth. But it isn't just like the trailer court, the trailer's going to go out and come back to the same spot. That spot won't even exist. It's going to be a completely different design. That, that's a very accurate statement. Is I, I'm not going to comment about the trees because I haven't gotten that far yet. That's not a thing that I've analyzed much. But the trailer, when it comes out, will not go back to the same spot. It's not like you're going to pick your trailer up, wait for it to be done, and then move your trailer back in. It, it's a totally new layout. You will find a new spot. There will be more room per trailer. So there's going to be more green space per trailer than there currently is. Um, <coughs> And so that, those are the types of issues. We think that there's more value in having uh, more space. You can give better rents. Um, we still want it to be kind of a vacation site, not a year-round trailer house. So it's not going to be a year-round site. It'll probably be April to October, the end of October. But those are, those are decisions that we made. And, and so that's how this is kind of coming into place. Um, but from the standpoint of... It will definitely look a lot different. There's a question over here. So, uh, first, just thank you to the council you, uh, for the amount of time you folks put in. I don't think you get overtime. <laughs> so it's really. Uh, it's a lot of work. You know, it's a lot of community service. I thank you for that. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, well, I think all of the council members and staff really care about Lake Mills. We're not there because we care about today. We're looking at not only today, but tomorrow and the next generation coming in. That's also one of the reasons I know there's some people in town, it's a small percent, but some people in town who don't think we should own Sandy Beach at all. And the thing is, is that if you give up control of that area, then that part of the lake will not be available to the public. It will be available to the people who have the money to do whatever they do, and you and I and the little person down the street will not get to use that beach. They'll be using Bartles, they'll be using the county park, but you won't go down and use Sandy Beach because somebody's going to make that into something like you see in other cities. And, you know. Yeah, actually two unrelated questions. <laughs> Is thought that the fruit of the following trees to use native species it would be a pretty inexpensive way, I would hope, to try to improve the, uh, the local environment. The second would be I, I was at the meeting, we talked about the dredging, and this big question seems to be how fast it's going to fill in, which is almost unknowable. And I'm wondering if maybe it would be, I'm sure you're thinking about it, to do the limited one first, and that would give you a couple of years to monitor how fast it comes in before committing to trying to open a big channel for bigger boats and raising the bridge and da 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 da. It's some talk like that. So, um, but it's just talk at this point. We haven't met to, to discuss it yet. Council hasn't gotten to the point of discussing. That was our first meeting as well. Oh, yeah, so you know as much as we know, right? <laughs> uh, that's what, you know, like you said originally, we have a lot of work ahead of us. But um, we, are, we are looking at, you know, what can we sustain? You know, we could do something. It's like everything, like, like we now have a program in the city to repair buildings, city buildings. We didn't have that 50 years ago. So what happened is we had buildings, we built buildings, we had, you know, the band shelter, and then it needed repair and there was no money to fix it. So we now have that built into Rob's uh, department <coughs> as well and so forth. But we're looking at the same with, with the mill pond too. It makes no sense to spend a ton of money today if you're not going to support it down the road or you won't be able to support it down the road. Uh, so that's, we're looking at that as well. And we don't know whether we'll get this grant that we were thinking we'd like to apply for. No, you don't always get grants, and that's a 50-50 grant. So it's a nice grant, but nobody says we're going to get it. <clears throat> Obviously, there, there were vast differences in the cost based on whether we, there would be someone willing to take that material versus having to landfill it. 
Um, I have had calls already from people who are interested in having that material applied to their farm fields. Uh, so I'm an, an anticipating that it would be at the lower end. So then you look at each smaller job costs more. There are all these associated costs with issuing the, um, but one of those contracts. So you have mobilization, you have all the contract documentation, you have all the... So the bigger the job, the, the better the bang per buck. So we have to evaluate <clears throat> what we believe is the long-term value. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to admit to something I don't want anybody to talk about. <laughs> we are terrible at data. We're pretty good at the outcome, but how we got there, we're not exactly sure. Um, and so what we're trying to do is, so when you look at that and you're saying, can we evaluate how long it took to fill it in? Well, <clears throat> you have to have some method for doing that. So you have to know what your key performance indicators are. You have, to, you have to know all these types of things that you're going to evaluate when you're looking at, well, what did occur? What influenced it? And so, you, you know, if we, pull, if we do those stormwater improvements right away, how much effect did that have on it? How much did uh, improving the shore banks have on it? How much did changing the channel have on it? Um, we're looking at doing some pretty substantial stormwater improvements in that northwest side of the city in the next five years. Um, how much impact will that have on it? So. As you, as you start to evaluate this and you're looking at what the actual variables were that impacted the overall sedimentation, it, you kind of have to be able to start picking and choosing. So it would be nice if we could go back to, I think it was 91 when they did the last dredging and kind of get a set of information from that and then take this one and kind of go from there and then start building data up for what we think um, the best future options are going to be. Um, so from a standpoint of saying, okay, we want to do the small one and do the evaluation, it, it, it might be such a small set of data that it doesn't give us a good picture. So the more data we could pick up from the old stuff, this data picture, and then in the future, um, we may get a better picture. So how that works out will be difficult to, to analyze at this point, but uh, we're, we're trying to set ourselves up to be able to... I don't think anybody ever thought about the long-term maintenance of the mill pond with a dam in it. And so now we're trying to get to that point of saying, okay, these are the things that we need to do to that. These are the things we continue to need to do, and then every so many years we need to add this. Um, and so that's what we're trying to evaluate. That's what this was kind of about. It was, it was much about that as whether we need to dredge it or not. Um, and so those are kind of the ideas that we're trying to get into more and more. So like when we, you know, when we did the building stuff, we want to get more data on our buildings survive, what are the keys to making them work. So we have them inspected every year now. And then those reports go to the department heads and the department heads get to analyze how they incorporate that into the budget and then the budget is then analyzed for how much we put into those each year and those types of things. So it's, it's starting to change but it, it hasn't been great. So like Dwayne's project on the street maintenance, we do a very, we actually videotaped all the streets uh, we go through and record every one of those uh, areas. We keep a full set of data. We have to provide all that data to the state in a report that is Whistler. And the program is called Fate PACER. And so now we have years and we start to have years and years of data that we can start analyzing to say what occurred. Um, and then that helps us figure out how to maintain it. So. We used to just go from a, okay, these are the streets that we think need to be fixed to now uh, we are on a program where uh, we know that the street, we've, we've attempted to maintain the street onto a, almost a 70-year cycle, I think. Is it 60 or 70? 60-year 60. 60 cycle. 
Um, and then we can say, oh yeah, that's a bad street. But what happens is, is you're always going to have about 8% of your streets that are really bad. <laughs> and so someone's going to be going, why did they fix that street? Not mine, no. You've you got to get to the bottom. Uh, but those are, those are the types of things that we've been spending a lot of time on. Process, organization, data collection, and how we're going to use it. So what are your key points? What can we gather? What can't we gather? One of our main arguments is, and, I, and I'm guaranteeing you someone here has said it to me a million times, is I don't have time. Um, but I think if you took the time now, eventually it would pay off in the long run to what you're going to produce. But it, it is hard because we're a very, very lean personnel organization. And we do probably more contracting than anybody realizes. We probably do more, our overall percentage of work completed in the city, more of it's contract than it's actually performed internally. So things like contract administration, who in our organization is a contract administrator? There, there's technically not one single person in our organization that's a good contract manager. We don't have one single person in our organization who's a good purchaser, Purse, purchasing agent. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's not unusual for a small city to have those issues, and and there are costs. So when does it become a valuable? When does it become a valuable enough? And the city makes those decisions themselves. Are they willing to to not pay this person to do that because the value of that person? doesn't hit the point where they think they're going to generate enough benefit. I don't think people realize that as, as a whole, the city is almost a $30 million operation. Because when you take electric, water, sewer, and then all the general government operations, uh, there's a lot of money moving through that place. And... <clears throat> Financial management in a small organization that's very lean becomes very difficult. So when you have one person who becomes sick and ends up not coming back to work, you can have some real problems. And um, being able to carry on with just your absolute minimum, just getting payroll out, becomes extremely difficult much less generating all the other data that you're trying to keep in track of. So we as an organization have capacity and resource issues, and so when does that benefit tip bringing in the additional resources? Because almost all resources to us are financial, and that means some sort of tax or some sort of fee that has to go up. And so you look at lead service laterals. We, have, we had absolutely no anticipation we were going to be doing lead service laterals. This year, lead service laterals, while the homeowner got a grant and paid for the vast majority of it, the city didn't get anything. And every one of those cost us a minimum of $5,000. So when you figure that there were 50, more than about 54 of those done, and at least 50 of them required us to dig into the street and replace our portion, and so you have 50 times $5,000, which you had absolutely no anticipation was going to occur. That's a lot of money to come up with when you did not know that was going to happen. And then, you know, we have a five-year plan, so all our streets are being fixed on that five-year plan, and then all of a sudden someone decides, to, hey, we're going to replace our lead lateral, and now we're digging a hole in the street we just fixed. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> very frustrating from management council level to his level to the staff level. I mean, you know, we would like everything to be just the way we want it to be, but we don't control all these things that are happening in the world around us. And uh, so it is, it is stressful. You know, we, <clears throat> we have issues like we have a lot of water loss. So we pump a lot of water that we don't bill. 
where's all that water going? Well, that's a good question, which Dwayne doesn't know yet. <laughs> but, but to comment, the, the staff has uh, done a number of fix, uh, fixes. Uh, water loss is decreasing. Um, the overall pumpage this year, I believe, was down 33 million gallons. So they are making a, a huge effort, and, 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 and they obviously they are making strides in that effort. Um, Steve didn't mention, though, that much of the water main system is 100 to 125 years old. Uh, the answer to that question is, probably lies quite a bit in the age of the system itself. Um, we are looking at uh, replacing uh, with AMI meters, um, so as we're replacing meters, um, much of the meters in the system are quite aged as well. Uh, so as those are being replaced, we are also uh, accounting for some of the loss in those in those meters as well. Uh, the new meters are obviously collecting uh, more information than maybe an older meter was. Uh, more like accurate, accurate. more accurate. Uh, they're also, the larger meters would, are picking up the low flow. So a larger meter, an older larger meter, may not have picked up a slight small leak. Mm -hmm. That meter wouldn't pick that information up. Some of the technology is changing, so as those new meters are being replaced on the larger end, we're talking not just a, a regular home, but a larger end, will now read at that lower level. So we are getting more accuracy there. Um, we are making improvements, on, as I said, that 33 million uh, gallon reduction. However, we also have seen uh, water usage go down uh, on a number of areas, uh, obviously water conservation by by residents, they're aware of how much water they're using, so they're reducing, so there is that reduction. Um, so actually, the percentage of uh, water loss is not uh, reducing as fast as we would like it to because the actual the, the amount of usage is going down as well. And I want to mention that we do have a program where with the new, new meters, we can get the information from those meters without going in the homes now, isn't that? that you can read them electronically? Correct. We, and, we've been able to read it outside the home, by a, but you had to walk up to the house and hit the push button. Now you, we don't even have to have anybody out there. The meter sends a signal to a tower that then records every 15 minutes what your water usage is. So if you have a leak in your house, if you have an unusual amount of water flowing out of your house for a 24 hour period, we get an alarm that tells us, hey, you should contact these people and let them know that something's going on. Uh, used to be on a monthly basis that occurred, now it can happen in a 24-hour time period. So th these meters are much more accurate. They, we will eventually not need a meter reader anymore. But the, the, the other end of that is that if there were locations where water was being used but we didn't know it, we are going to know it now, and they will get both for what they use. Uh, 20 years ago, <laughs> well, okay, <laughs> who's the mind reader around here? Nobody, you know. So, but today we, we do have technology in our favor coming along, so, which helps everybody, because if somebody's getting it for nothing, you're paying for it. So, that's, we're working on that. Ron? I'd like to, morning Steve, to everyone. I'd like to touch on uh, the Mill Pond project again. Now, this past year, you, the uh, DNR state came in and did a uh, sedimentation testing on both the channel and the east end. And I'm wondering, does that have anything to impact your decision on which way to go in regards to the state or the DNR coming in? And also in the report, which you graciously gave me, thank you. They mentioned the feasibility of shoreline reparation and also the application of the shoreline, which means, like on the northeast corner, the old house that's going to be a uh, fish house, pretty soon. Um, are things like that going to be attacked? And does that have any bearing on you? And the main question, have you received any word as to what they determined the feasibility of anything came out of their report? 
Well, first of all, it wasn't the DNR that did that. It was the city, and it was Luke Hellerman and, and another employee from Strand, and they did those samplings, and so that's all in the report. And then that was submitted to um, a lab for analysis, and then this report goes to the DNR. Um, <clears throat> the report told us that the mill pond was pretty standard. There was one chemical in there that might have made it a little bit more difficult, and I'm trying to remember what it is, but it's something, I, I anticipate it's a runoff from pavement. So modifying the stormwater systems will probably help clean that up in the long run. I think it was like gas or oil or something along that line. They tested for all that, but they didn't find any in significant numbers other than the, that one location there was some gas, which, which I anticipate is probably running off that parking lot in your back. So how we modify the stormwater runoff out of that site will probably impact that. But that study, what that was looking at is, is where we can haul that, um, what we dredge out of the mill pond. And, and it wasn't in enough, it wasn't problematic enough that we had to haul it to a special landfill. We could land apply it. Um, and so that's what that testing was about. Um, Changing the shoreline for us involves, there are a bunch of crumbling walls, there are some areas there that are eroding, um, and those are the erosion control impacts that we have to have, because basically what's happening is behind those walls, that material is starting to seep through those cracks, and so you're noticing that those banks are dropping down quite a ways behind the, the walls. So we have to figure out how to control that erosion. The... <sighs> The boathouse is a private property issue. For us, I don't know that it rises to the level of a raise order. Um, we would at least need a complaint to start working on. Um, if it falls into the water, it would probably be a DNR issue, not a city issue. Um, so those are those are some questions that that. Uh, I don't technically know about right now. Most shoreland changes on the mill pond have, have to go through the DNR. And I'm anticipating that anything that occurs will depend on the level of dredging that's done. Um, so... <clears throat> Would the landowner have? The landowner... It totally controls that. They would submit a permit to us, and the permit would have to have the, that the DNR signed off on it. Any sh any sh work done at the at the ordinary high water mark has to have a DNR permit. Um, so we would, if it came in to us, we have a certain amount of codes for how you change the shoreland, and um, that would, and the first thing we'd look at is a DNR permit because. The DNR regulates everything at the ordinary high water mark. Uh, so at that for the, that, it's hard for me to say what would go on there. I, I anticipate most of our debate is going to center around dredging and then what type of maintenance we do on the mill pond regularly to, to try and reduce the amount of dredging that needs to be done in the future. Um, and that will probably take a lot of conversation and work with the engineer over the next year to see what we really have. We'll probably have to sit down with the uh, DNR, kind of finalize our plans, and then I'm assuming at some point we'll, we'll have public hearings and, and public participation meetings and those types of things. That's the council's decision, but they historically have done those. So we'll, we'll kind of work through that process. But I, I don't anticipate, we may suggest some sort of shoreland improvements but because they're all private property owners, we're not going to do anything. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I just want to mention, I don't think a lot of people in town know that there's a very nice walking trail on the south end of the mill pond. You go behind the fire department, there's like a road, and you take that and you come out on Ferry Drive. 
and boy, some of the Boy Scout troop, troop or troops, I'm not sure if it was more than one, have done work in there, but it's a real nice walking trail. So if you're looking for somewhere to go, um, and once you know where the other end comes out on Ferry Drive, you can go the other way back. But it's easy to find it from the fire department and going west. So you might want to do that this spring rolls around. Uh, any any word on uh, the future of the golf course? A year and a half ago, we built a house on Pinnacle Drive. We love it. You know, we moved all around the state and outside of the state, and we, we chose to move here, and we you know, we're very happy. And we love the golf course right there. You know, we're members there. We're just wondering if you know, from your perspective, any any uh, anything to report? Any any issues with the golf course? Uh, its future status or anything of that nature? We have no. Nothing. information on the golf course yeah, yeah. Um, it's a private business and we try to stay out of <laughs> people's <laughs> business we have enough of our own problems without trying to get into anybody else's but no we haven't heard anything and there's nothing in the plans so I guess, as far as we know you're okay <laughs> we hope they're okay so. um, Anita? I have well, two things, but one question, and I have to admit that I've been busy with other things, <laughs> and I haven't, <clears throat> excuse me, read, read the report yet, but I thought a couple years ago there was discussion about that mill pond dredging, that it was highly driven by DNR because there were some endangered or special consideration species. Am I remembering correctly in there or something? The, it was kind of flip. Um, we had several issues related to boat access and the amount of sedimentation in the bottom and um, odors being generated. A lot of the sedimentation kind of slides into, was sliding into the spillway, which are, there's a lot of stormwater activity in there. Activity. Almost all the stormwater systems that come down Church Street, and West Lake Street drain into the spillway there at the mill pond. <clears throat> and so as that sedimentation was decomposing, it was pushing, was it sodium or sulfide? Sulfide something, gases back up. And a lot of those buildings there are attached to that stormwater system, and so the smells was getting into some of the apartments upstairs. So that was kind of what was driving the question is, is what do we need to do to start improving these conditions? The debate on the other side was is that there were, I think there's one endangered species that's been in, identified in the mill pond, and there's some other aquatic vegetation issues in the mill pond that have to be resolved. So that's, you know, if we decided to do it, we would have to go through a permit process with the DNR and how we would handle all that. So generally what you're looking at is, <clears throat> depending on how serious the issue was and, and when we did it, there are two types of dredging. There's mechanical and there's hydraulic. And so you might look at more of a hydraulic dredging requirement, which is a little bit more expensive. Um, we try, from a city standpoint, we try and stay out of the means and methods, which is mechanical and hydraulic, because uh, then the less we, generally contractors know best how to run their businesses. We ask them to generate an outcome while controlling certain features, and then they, they hit that. But sometimes the DNR may impose more strict requirements on us than we originally anticipated. So I, <clears throat> I don't think that it'll be impossible to dredge the mill pond. Uh, I, I think we can get a permit. I, I'm not concerned about that. It's more along the lines of what benefit does it get us at what time. And th those are the debates that we need to have. I, I imagine at some point in time we're going to have to dredge the mill pond. It's when is the best time to do it. And then what do we do with it? Um, you know, we're looking at the stormwater improvements. Some of the stormwater improvements that we do, if we do all the stormwater improvements, they're going to drive the channel work. The channel work is going to drive some dredging. Well, once you start dredging, then you, again, it's back to how big should the contract be in order to accomplish the best bang for our buck. Because it's not like we have a lot of money flowing around that we can just dredge the mill pond, little portions of the mill pond every time. So we're trying, we, we have to weigh and balance those. So 
those are items that we were looking at there. Um, so I, <clears throat> you're, you're right about what was some of the conversations we had while we were discussing that. Um, and some of that came out of the dam work, because when we looked at the dam work, um, it also had to do with how we, we um, set up the coffer dam. Um, I also wanted to, if it's okay, um, I know that um, as a community, the town and the city, um, we all have concerns or there's been issues with regards to what's happened at the chicken farm. And um, it is something that does, I mean, I, I sort of have come to this conclusion that what happens on Crossman Road doesn't stay on Crossman Road. And we know that the odors and other issues do impact our city. We've proven that. So um, I wanted to announce that we're going to have a community information meeting on Thursday, February 8th from 6.30 to 8.30. We just um, reserved the room at the municipal building at the, in the community center room. Um, and we are hoping that Daybreak uh, Foods Management and or ownership will come to answer some people's questions. We'll have some information. Our goal is to keep it positive, um, to keep everybody respectful, but to, to discuss things now because I think that um, now is the time for people to come together and work together and make that situation the best for everyone because um, it, you know, that's a major employer in our area. The Daybreak Foods Creekwood is a major employer. They're staying, they're not going, and I think we want to make it the best situation for everybody. So I encourage everyone to come and to come prepared with their questions. No, you just said Tuesday, February 8th. I'm sorry, I said Tuesday. Yeah, Thursday, it's Thursday. It's February. Thursday, February 8th from 6.30 to 8.30 at the municipal building. Um, I attended the meeting at the town mm -hmm. with, with you. I've been involved in that. I have gone through all the documents. I have them on my computer, so I, I've analyzed all of them. Um, so I, I have a pretty good idea of what's going on. I know where the city, you know, what kind of regulatory authority the city has, which is none. Well, the only thing I would like to say, and I know that there's many inside and outside and upside town politics, but, and maybe that's prohibitive, but I do think that people that are um, in a leadership capacity, people who have expertise, in water, which I is not my area, I think you still can have the capability to comment as a private citizen and to clearly indicate to the DNR when you comment when the public hearing process becomes in effect, which should be soon on the water permit. And I really ask if any of you have concerns as someone who's not a municipal representative that you, in writing, put your concerns and state that you're responding as a private citizen. And the same thing goes, there are people who, for various reasons, don't wish to represent or, or really cannot represent the views of their employer, but they have private views. So I'm really asking for the leadership. I know people um, that this is a divisive issue, and I think we could make it less divisive. But I think now's the time to speak up. Um, now is the time, as soon as the hearing process starts, to, to do something. So I really implore you to please act as a private citizen if there are issues that are going to prevent you from acting as a member of the city or city council or city employer or whatever. I'm really imploring people because I don't have the expertise at, you know, um, in water. I'm not a water engineer. I'm still learning. Um, the learning curve is extremely steep. These issues are so incredibly complex, um, you know, even for someone who's got at least a BS degree, which whatever that means. <laughs> so thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to say that. <clears throat> Any other questions? Well, I would like to thank everybody who came today. I thank people who contact us outside of this meeting. Um, you know, I always say it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it takes citizens to keep a, a city going. And you can never have everything in a very finite group of people. We are just a part 
of the city of Lake Mills. You are the other part of the city of Lake Mills. So if you have some expertise in an area, if you see something that you go, holy cow, you know, please contact one of us and let us know what you see because we might not see it. So thank you for your time and for your concern.